So they stand up, big hands. They say it's because like from an evolutionary psych perspective, like if there was like an animal attacking you, you try to look as big as possible. Maybe not a bear, I think you're supposed to just run away with something. But yeah. Oop. Hello everyone, I'm uh, Ali Patterson from Fintech Finance. Welcome to the Fintech Fire Round. Today I am joined by Megan Cooper. Hello. It is Megan, not Megan, is it? I've... It's Megan, yeah. Megan. I find that it's normally people from like New Zealand, Australia type of area that think it's Megan. I think it's more commonly produced in that kind of Oceania part of the world, but it is Megan. I've definitely heard it pronounced Megan, so, mm. so I had to kind of like, I had to double double check. No, and I finally switched to using my married name of Cooper. So between the, those two confusions, it's Megan Cooper, not Megan Cooper. Would so yeah yeah got it all nailed down there. Excellent excellent little little blurby thing for you just just read this out so Forbes thirty under thirty mm -hmm. very nice I yeah, see that's on your Twitter as well which is kind of a good yeah you got to good... keep it on there yeah yeah when, when you get that that's got to stay there for uh, forever yeah business insiders top women in fintech mm -hmm. yeah, decent yeah. accolade yeah yeah chief platform officer at Starling mm -hmm. Um, and obviously flying with the Eagles now at Barclays. Yeah, yeah, now Chief Platform Officer at Barclays as well. So yeah, yeah, it's quite good. Um, yeah, no, I've been in London for about like half a decade now. Sounds better than five or five years, but um, but no, I really like it. I've done um, lots of work now in the finance sector and yeah, thankfully have gotten some cool recognition for it. So it's been a good ride so far. I say it's definitely, definitely deserved. Yeah, thanks. Right, this is how this works. We've got a bunch of Again, my wife would like to have it known. They are very well cooked chicken wings. <laughs> they look amazing. Uh, so please do absolutely. All right. Uh, we're going to start kind of at this end here and work our way down to increasingly uh, spicy, uh, spicy ones. Feel free to go nuts with yogurt and milk. Oh, I will. Um, <laughs> we are actually uh, live right now at uh, hi everyone at FinTech South uh, over in Atlanta, um, but we're 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 going to go for a source from another south. But this is the uh, the south of uh, of England. This is flaming naga chili sauce, which is produced locally. So if you Very like nice. to have a, a, a wee yeah, bit of that. Yeah, sure. I like the, the local support here. Um, I'll forewarn everyone that I'm actually pretty bad with spicy food. So this one maybe I'll be a bit more generous with because it's the least spicy one. I'm also not good with, uh, with spicy food. But the, fir the first thing I want to talk about is, um, let's talk a little bit about the research days. What does that actually mean? So you just would have spent your days literally just Googling Huh, what does this thing do and trying to how how does yeah. research actually try and breed independent thought and why is it important yeah, and, sure. and dig in dig in yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it looks really good well it started when i was at university and actually i had intended to do research as a career in academia so i was starting with cognitive um psychology research and then social cognitive neuroscience and so i did a bit at pepperdine my alma mater as well as um Oh no, that's because it's the mildest one, it worries me. Um, but yeah, and then at Stanford and at Yale, and I just, I loved it. I thought it was so great. But the research was um, very like lone wolf. You know, you come up with your hypothesis, you structure the, the research, you run, you run it. Like whenever you're at the university level, you end up doing everything kind of end to end, but it's a very singular activity, right? And so then you go to a conference and present the results. But at the same time, I was asked to co-found uh, the Entrepreneur Club at my university with a good friend. And the whole idea is we would just use our club's budget as capital um, to start an LLC and do this low risk uh, kind of tech adventure. And I loved it to be honest. It was very, like we formed a little cross-functional team. So people from software engineering to design to myself on more of like the product marketing side, product and marketing, I should say. Um, and it was my first foray into the world of software development and I just loved it. And so I was like, well, instead of doing my PhD, let me just take some time to try to work in San Francisco and see how that goes. Um, and I never looked back. I loved it so much. It's pretty excellent, actually. Yeah. I always remember Richard Branson um, put out. It's surprisingly, isn't it? I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so, mild than you think. Well, he said we, sh we should have business classes where it's literally your student loan is your capital. There you are. Go and yeah. go, go and start something. Yeah, Richard Branson is, I'd say, quite forward thinking in terms of how young people can be whenever they can be a successful entrepreneur. So I've seen some things. I think where he's basically saying, even instead of doing university, you could just take some time out to try to start your own business. But yeah, to instead of like going and setting a more formal curriculum, just learn through doing. And I think that's quite a cool, um, cool way to do it as well. But was there um, like a penny drop moment with software where you were like, actually, the fact that I've X, Y, and Z can lead to this. Was there any kind of any kind of moment where you thought, actually, this is quite cool and this could, this can seriously affect things? 
Yeah, well, to be honest, when I first started doing it, um, I had never worked in technology or business. I didn't, all my internships were around research, right? So I didn't, I had no idea what the roles were. Yeah, I was like, what do you do? Like, what are people doing in those big buildings? You know, like I had no idea. So actually my first um, kind of moment was seeing what the power was to create something quite quickly that could reach people at scale just by virtue of technology and the internet and mobile. That was really exciting, but exactly what role I'd play in it and which role I'd be good at was pretty unclear to me. So when I first went into Intuit, um, I started at uh, TurboTax, if you're familiar. So I went to Intuit not because I loved the idea of tax software or accounting or payroll, but because they were known to be a great place to work. And if you wanted to learn how to become a best in class product manager, that's where you go in Silicon Valley. So it's like, well, I'll start there and see how it goes. Um, but I just loved it. Like, honestly, it was like, I, I've enjoyed everywhere I've worked in my career, but probably actually when I was first at TurboTax, um, might have been actually the happiest like I have just ever been because San Diego, if you're familiar, it's just like the quality of life is so amazing. The people are very laid back, but working in product like that high of like discovering something that I just love doing. You could work with this like amazing team of people, build something, get it into customers' hands and like tax software. I actually find quite exciting or banking because it's taking something that's so high anxiety, so stressful, something that people don't want to do and making it as easy and fast as possible for them is actually to me something that I can get, you know, wake up and feel good about doing. So I think having like kind of a dent in that part of the universe was something that I got excited about. And I like the skills uh, that I happen to have that were able to kind of drive good work there. We talked a lot about uh, small businesses because the research we found is that small businesses in the US felt that for things like accounting, payroll, tax, if they could start their own business, they could keep their own books, you know? So they wanted to do everything and just kind of bootstrap was like the general kind of ethos of the personas we create. Um, but at the same time, they didn't want to become experts. They don't necessarily want to become accountants. They just wanted something that was easy, that made them feel confident they were doing it correctly, that helped them to do that and then focus more on what they were passionate about. And so I was thinking, you know, if you could really unlock the potential of all of these entrepreneurs across the US, by enabling them to focus more on what they love by just making this part easy, then that's uh, that's quite a cool thing to do. So yeah. Right, gra gra grab another wing, okay, grab another yeah, wing. Here we go. This next one is yeah. called, and I believe, the zombie apocalypse sauce. Ooh. In the outbreak of a uh, zombie apocalypse, oh, I, yeah. on my, I, I want Anne on my squad because I- oh, Yeah, absolutely. There's no one else. I mean, she's gonna be such an effective leader of your team against the zombies. Like who else would you wanna work with in that case? Yeah, no, I'm right there with you. Practical, absolutely. So let's, let's talk about the move from uh, Silicon Valley to Thames Valley. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, Starling on paper back in, I wanna say 2016, mm -hmm. um, it was kind of a very different beast to what it is now. Yeah, yeah. I recently read uh, um, the Nike book, Shoe Dog. Oh yeah. Incredible book, mm -hmm. but the guy has some very close calls and is relying on the time it takes checks to clear in order to keep Nike alive. Mm -hmm. What was the uh, what were the close calls at Starling? But let's have, have, yeah, have, a, have yeah. a bite of this and then, okay. and then, and then okay. tell me right. what, what some of the uh, mm. the close calls where it was like, hang on a second, we, we've, we're waiting on this check to clear. <laughs> this one's funny. Because like at first you're like, that's not that spicy. And then it has this kick like three seconds later. <laughs> that's really quite spicy, but it's it's really good. <laughs> no. Mm. So with Starling, I think um, probably the, 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 the foundation I'd lay is that working with Anne is such like a privilege that I, I, I would hope for anyone who wants to work in like the startup. I know they're so much bigger now that the kind of same experience I had probably isn't possible. Um, but I never felt like there was a close call. I never felt like there was an option of not being successful um, because we had such a strong team. But with having Anne as a leader, she's always thinking five steps ahead. She's seen through all of the things like in any given meeting, you know, she'd be like, this is going to happen. And this is going to happen. And we're going to get this, this feedback. We need to have this prepared so we can do this. Because at the time, as you can imagine, we were getting our banking license, working on some of the basics with a regulator, and not only building the technology, but it's a bank. It's just such a highly regulated product. Whew. Man, I can't wait for you to it's talk. Because like the air somehow like makes it even spicier in your mouth. It's amazing. Yeah, a little bit, little bit more. Oh, yeah, maybe we should like start on the yogurt, which would be quite good. No, but yeah. So I always felt like, thankfully. There was never a moment of close calls. It was just kind of moving from strength to strength. It felt like at the time I described it as like being strapped to a rocket ship um, because we were a small team, but we had such great people that I felt like I was good at what I did, but everyone was equally good at what they did. And it was just a very unique experience to be a part of, I think. I know a lot of startups 
go through their struggles and those moments of like, oh, am I gonna make it? You know, you hear stories about Tesla and Elon Musk paying people out of his bank account. You know, I remember one time Elon describing an entrepreneur as looking into the abyss while eating glass. And I was like, that is not selling entrepreneurship to anyone. But honestly, being at Starling wasn't at all like that. I mean, it's of course stressful in, a, in an early stage company because nothing is guaranteed. But it always felt like as much of a sure bet as it could be because we're building a bank. Banks are a pretty defined business model. You know, there's definitely a need for it. Um, and the kind of niche that we were focusing on in terms of how we were improving, it felt like just such an obvious need to me. And so it, as long as we were getting everything else lined up, it felt, in my mind at least, um, which actually now that I think about it, I think there is research to say that entrepreneurs aren't necessarily less risk averse. They just don't see risk as much because of the confidence. So maybe, maybe it was riskier than I was perceiving and I just uh, kind of was a bit more confident about it. But honestly, it felt like such an amazing experience and like we didn't have those close calls. Like, cause obviously you moved across from Zero and as a, um, as a, as a starting and a Zero customer on, on the platform yeah. together, yeah. Um, it, it was relatively new at the time of actually having that kind of, that, that kind of connection. Mm -hmm. what, what, what were some of the, the things in terms of the marketplace, in terms of the platform that oh, yeah. were the moonshots and you thought this is never, this is never <laughs> going to work, but we're going to go for it anyway, that actually yeah. kind of either, either turned around or turned into something else. Yeah, so um, when I started in Silicon Valley, it was during the moment of tech companies having their digital transformation. So very much realizing um, just the basics, like we need to be mobile first, we need to be design led, we need to get our data in a pile, we need to be personalized and have insights. All of these things I think banking is at the moment now where we're, we're really, it's come to the forefront in the financial industry, but in technology in Silicon Valley, this was like 10 years ago. And so one of the things that came up as part of that was platform strategy. And so that was really the shift of saying, okay, we're moving to the cloud. That enables a different interaction with our customers, how we um, compare them with their uh, like accountants or whoever advisors that they were using. But similarly, we might offer our customers three products, but small businesses use 15 on average. And so rather than trying to build out all of these products, what we had fundamentally realized is that APIs had made it such that we could strategically integrate rather than reinventing the wheel and having to build everything ourselves being very heavy and vertically integrated. And so um, Zero was actually really the thought leader in this. And at the time I was into it, just kind of watching how they were doing it. But effectively what they did is they built out this open API um, in lockstep with their core product. They immediately started integrating people like PayPal. And they did it so smart such that they were able to have this really full-fledged ecosystem from a er very early stage. Um, and they were just able to go into these markets like New Zealand, Australia, and just dominate the incumbents. Like, not just like a little bit, they just immediately took huge amounts of market share in a very obvious way. And so all of a sudden, NYOB and others were very criticized for being asleep at the wheel. And so it was pretty obvious when they came into the US that they were gonna do the same thing unless we got our act together. So we very quickly started looking at, okay, how do we strategically and tactically make sure that this we- This is when you were at Intuit, right? Yeah, when, when I was at Intuit. So Intuit did something similar, but as an incumbent who's used to having that full customer relationship, losing that customer to introduce them to other products was a huge leap. And so it was really around like uh, this ethos of disrupting ourselves um, or fixing the roof while the sun is still shining was kind of other phrases that we would use. Um, but effectively we needed to lean into a different model, a different way of doing things in addition to having new and improved technology, better user interfaces and all of that. So when I came into banking, I was like, well, it's very similar. You know, banks are used to having, owning the entire customer relationship. Um, but customers are increasingly using a lot of different fintechs for wealth management, for insurance, for mortgages, for any of these different things that they would use that banks used to offer all through one house. So rather than building everything ourselves, is there an opportunity to instead strategically collaborate, to give people options and do things a bit differently? And to just have open APIs and let people consume their data, which honestly open APIs, everything, you know, with open banking, PSD2, makes it seem uh, almost like taken for granted, but we started building out open API pre-open banking. So it seemed quite uh, crazy at the time, but now it's like, of course you have open APIs. But at the time, it seemed quite aggressive. I think Jim Maroos is always the one who had his disrupt yourself tour, as, oh, he, as yeah. he called no, it. I like to take credit for that. I feel like I oh, inspired okay. him. I don't know that I did. He's probably like, no, you didn't. I said it first, but I think I said disrupt yourself first. And, and that's, again, that's about trusting other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Next up is the aptly named 100% pain. How you, how, you do, how you doing with them? You know? Um, better than me. I don't think so. I think it's, it's very spicy, um, but we'll see how it goes. The last one just tricked me because I took a bite and I was like, oh, it's not that bad. And then it gets you like kind of after the fact. 
Now, as a, uh, as, as a media publisher, I, I've, I've got a gender ratio I need to look at. I always find that with our magazine, we, we've got to hit that gender ratio and it's tricky. And always at the end, I, I have press people trying to pitch me um, women to talk about diversity. Yep. And you've been interviewed, given a Google of yourself, a huge amount of times about diversity. As a mentor with various kinds of, sort of programs, what's the most important thing to get rid of having to do diversity articles and even look at the gender ratio? Because I, 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 I don't have time for that. I don't want to be looking at the gender ratio. I just want to have the best people in and it should be, should be even. Well, I think there is a reality that particularly in areas like finance, technology, there just aren't as many women at the top. There aren't as many women generally, um, but there aren't as many women at the top as we would like to see. So I think until we get to a, a place where we have the kind of representation we want, then it won't necessarily come uh, just naturally. We'll have to be a bit more intentional about our recruiting, about how we look for speakers and making sure we have that. I do think that the industry has done a really good job of saying, you know what, we want diversity before we have it, we'll try to make sure we have equal representation, we'll really work for that. I think it's good because it inspires a younger set of leaders to come up and say, you know, I want that too. I can also do that. And the more we have, I know it's so spicy. Oh, that's got me out on. Oh, just wait until you start speaking and then it just whew, really comes up. Yeah, so until we have that, I think it's good to be intentional about it. Um, but eventually, I hope it gets to a place where similar to what you're saying is, you know, I need an expert on this topic and here's obviously this like diverse group of candidates and the diversity is just kind of like self-created. Um, I will say at Barclays, I've been really impressed. I mean, I've, I've been there for a few years now and I've been really impressed by the amount of intention that the leaders put into uh, diversity and campaigning, campaigning for that throughout the bank and like what we do to celebrate um, women and other leaders across the bank and really be um, like intentional, not just take it for granted that it'll happen naturally. Because of course in banking, we now have metrics, you know, if you sign up to like the Women in Finance Charter. So there's certain things like that that kind of measure it from a data perspective. But I think going above and beyond to really trying to create um, equality in the workplace is really quite cool. What about um, mentorship? I mean, obviously you and Anne, I, yeah, yeah. I can tell from the way you're speaking, you're like, yeah, Anne's up here. So yeah. Cheryl Newton, who's now at um, uh, Metro Bank, was yeah. talking about mentorship and she was saying that if you see a young man with an, old, an older gentleman, uh -huh. it's mentorship. Yeah. You see an older gentleman, senior banker with a young lady, mm -hmm. looks like something else. Yeah, yeah. How can that get broken down, that kind of, that, that stigma? Yeah, well, I think, um, so in my career, like honestly, it, it might be a stigma of like, oh, that's mentorship. But honestly, I think that kind of organic and natural forms of just like finding people that you admire, that are experts in what you wanna be in. And even if you don't call them a mentor, just kind of like aligning your work to work with great people that you can learn from is like hugely strategic. But I do think there is still in, um, certainly in the UK, I don't know if I noticed it as much in, in Silicon Valley, but kind of like an old boys club, which is almost like an unspoken thing where yeah, there would be this kind of like pairing and helping in this network. I don't know that it was meant to be, I mean, maybe it was meant to be exclusive, but I don't know if that was the original intent so much as it just kind of happened that way given it was more male dominated. But I think um, I'd certainly do a lot of like very intentional mentorship of like younger female leaders in Barclays. But then I think there's a whole host of just like organic mentorship you have of like meeting people serendipitously like at Money 2020 or various conferences or seeing, you know, leaders in your workplace that you really admire and making sure to kind of try to get on projects with them to just sort of learn from people as you meet them, as you work with them and trying to, to create that kind of cohort in your life. Money 2020 Asia 2018, mm -hmm. I think you were on stage with uh, Lida and Gala. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was talking about ecosystems as a whole and yeah. about, well, I think you were talking a lot about Grab as an example of how they kind of created that sort of super app. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was incredible because I don't, it was an incredible panel and I don't think there was one talk about diversity, it just happened. Yeah, that's the thing is I think sometimes, honestly, when I used to be invited to talk about diversity on diversity panels, especially ones where it was like the strife of women and like the challenges we faced, I felt a bit worried because I had been surrounded by people and leaders that never made me feel different for being a female in my role. Even in San Francisco where I'd work on heavily male uh, not male dominated, but a large male ratio team. Um, I never, it never was like, oh, I'm obviously the female here. I never felt any different or treated any differently or I was promoted any differently. It just felt very equal. And of course at Starling, you have Anne leading it. And so of course it's not gonna feel 
you know, like there's a disparity between like the men and women in the bank. So I had had this very fortunate set of experiences where I didn't feel like I'd actually experienced all the struggles that other women had faced. But I, I still would speak on this because I think it's important to talk about diversity, how we do need to really create kind of um, a set of mentors and like a, a network to help other younger women come up into these leadership roles. Um, but I do think eventually that a better tactic or an equally good tactic is instead of talking directly about diversity, just have expert women doing their thing and that's inspirational in its own way. Like rather than talking about, oh, we need more women, just have expert women talking and like showcasing them and kind of enabling them and supporting them. Right, so uh, next one up we have got, uh, this is Dab Bomb, 135,000 Scovilles. Amazing. So uh, you know that uh, um, I think the CEO of Deutsche Bank said, we believe that technology is, is going to be an important part of our bank. <laughs> Brilliant. Nailed it. <laughs> and a lot of banks like BBVA have talked about how, you know, we, we want to be a tech company, not a bank. Yeah, yeah. You've gone from starting, which no. very frankly is a tech mm -hmm. company, not a bank, to Barclays, which is a bank, not a tech company. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a bit, culture shocks, what were kind of the biggest differences there in terms yeah. of in terms of getting stuff done, because Starling seemed to, yeah. it wasn't the move fast and break things you see in the likes of Revolut, but yeah. it was move fast and get things done. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have a bite first, but this, this should be interesting. Oh, yeah. oh my God. It's like hot from the moment you bite it. Like that's your sign that it's really hot. <laughs> it's really good though, but very spicy. Whew. Really good. Um, so Barclays and Starling. Barclays, the reason why I joined is because, um, kind of as I explained in the beginning, um, I truly wake up very passionate about the space that I feel like I can make a dent in this world in, which is improving people's financial lives. And the way I used to say it a bit bluntly was, I felt like banking, oh, I know, I, like crying. Mm. <laughs> My throat literally burns. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, this is like the best interview style. Oh. I genuinely wake up caring about, um, about the space I want to try to make an impact in. I genuinely felt like banking sucked at the time. But at Starling, we're really onto a way of doing things differently and better to better serve customers. And so with Barclays, I felt like when I looked across the landscape of incumbent banks, they were doing things uh, the best as far as the incumbents went. And when I met with the leadership there, I felt like they really got it. They got the vision. So even though it's this massive 80,000 person company, I felt like as long as I had the support from the leadership, then we had a chance to do things differently. And when we did things really exceptionally well as a bank becoming a technology company, we could be a good um, example to other banks. Oh, man, sorry. Like everything, I'm like crying, my nose is running. Oh, yeah. But yeah, so there was a bit of like culture shock, but it was all what I anticipated. So the culture shock I experienced was very much kind of what you'd expect on the TIM. They're, they're banks or they're going to be risk averse or certain processes or certain governance. And you have to figure out how to kind of improve not only the ways of working, but making sure you have your strategy right around um, technology and what you do and how you do it. I think, um, for me though, it was very much like working with the wind at my back in terms of with a whole team uh, that very much believed in this vision of like banks need to be technology companies. I think, was it Deutsche Bank? So there was no question I feel like at Barclays of like, do we need to like focus on technology? Is this gonna be a thing? I think everyone just got of like, of course, like technology is the future. It's very much changing the business model of banking. We've obviously been heavily investing in it and we wanna continue to do so. So I just kind of like came in with that. Um, I think the other benefit is like one thing I had read, um, I don't know what book it was in. It was actually from a pamphlet that a leader at Intuit had given me around like your first 90 days. And it was kind of assessing like what kind of situation are you in? Like, is it more of a startup and you need to build the team or is it like a change situation? Anyways, there's all these like different rubrics. And then it said like, if you're in this change situation, you really need to kind of walk carefully in terms of recognizing that certain people in the organization will be adverse to change. Like there's a natural hesitation from people to want to change sometimes. Um, and then if the, anything does go wrong, realize how that will reflect on you as a leader. So make sure that you're getting the support and blah, blah, blah. Just kind of like tactically, how do you do um, a big change? And so I kind of had that in my mind. But then, you know, whenever we were working through our strategy and what we did and how we structured, like everyone was just immediately on the same page and there was like excitement there. So I think even though 
Barclays is a big bank and they obviously are more of a bank than a technology company, although hoping to change that. I think it, because it's a 328 year old bank, no one takes it as personally as Starling. At Starling, you are Starling. You know what I mean? Like, so if there's a, a critique of Starling, it's like you very much want to own it and change it because that's a critique on you. But at Barclays, it's 328 years old. So I think it almost gives us a little bit of room to say, actually that could be improved. This is something that we started developing when technology is forming. That needs to be improved to like get to like pace it where we are now and have those kind of frank discussions, I think worked quite well for me. Now that I'm more in like a specific technology role as chief platform officer, I think it's even easier because before as head of digital strategy, I worked across the entire bank. And so when people would be like, oh, how like forward thinking or how, how well does Barclays run? It was difficult to give a one size fits all answer because it's such a big bank and you have US teams and UK teams and you have an investment bank. Um, and so I was like, you know, some teams are already like from a standing start can like operate like a technology company and others have farther to go. So it's hard to give a, a blanket answer, but all in all, it's been really positive, but they are still a bank and we're still becoming a, like a full blown technology company. Let's go on to the final one. Now, this one is 357 Scoville. So by comparison, the previous one was 130. So you have a wee bit of that. Now, um, I, 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 I was thinking about, I've always wanted to be a filmmaker because I used to watch lots of making of documentaries. And uh, I think that's kind of the reason why. We now live in a world of like the Silicon Valley TV show, making the world a better place and all that. Mm -hmm. what, what gets you out in the morning? It gets you out of bed in the morning. You don't get out of work. I can't wait to work today. What specifically is it that makes you? Mm. <clears throat> I think it's evolved over the years, like that answer. I will say, um, like I love my work now, but genuinely when I, like that first story of working at TurboTax, like I, I went and after that worked on uh, what's called QuickBooks Online. So I only did a, like about a six month set on TurboTax. But I think about it sometimes because genuinely, I got out of bed every day so excited about work. Um, actually I say that, but there was part when I was working on the UK product for the first time. It was the first time I ever worked 100 hour weeks just for fun. Like I worked constantly, I worked nights and weekends. I thought it was just like the best thing. Um, but there was a lot of work, but I really enjoyed it. I think now I, I, you know, as you get older and you have kids, like you still love your work, but you're no longer as like pressed to work 100 hour weeks for fun. But I, like, I think the thing is, it's kind of twofold. So one is the opportunity we have still on the side of like improving customers' financial lives, being hugely inspirational but also the team I have is just excellent. Like they're all just such good people. They're kind people, we enjoy working together. And I think um, finding that in your workplace makes all the difference in the world. So then if you do come across like some challenge with something that makes it harder or slower to get things done, it doesn't matter because you have that team spirit and that camaraderie and you're working with such a good group of people that's like doesn't let any, oh, I know. This one Excuse. stays, this one stays. I know, I had like way too much confidence. I'm like, this is fine. It's kind of like that second one where I was like, oh. um, no, but then that you can come overcome any of these challenges together and really do excellent work. But I think the team is really what, what drives me these days. I think we did, um, actually it was a, a mutual friend, uh, Nina Mahanti, the, the careers talk, and it was about entrepreneurship. And the, the big thing, of how to be an entrepreneur, the number one thing, be a decent person in the first instance because that mm -hmm. leads through to everything else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think um, I, there's enough research anyhow that like actually supports like happier teams drive better results. And so I don't know if someone at Barclays read this, but I will say in in Barclays, there is very much this culture of like, let's support employees and their well beings. Like, let's work flexibly. This pandemic has been tough. Let's make sure that we really think through um, how we support each other through this and to like do good work, but to also make sure that we're like happy and healthy at the same time. And to be honest, I have found, oh, hang on. <laughs> mm. I really feel like I go through waves. I'm like, I'm okay now. And then it's like, it's like it comes back. Oh, this is uh... Uh, at least a linger. <laughs> yeah. So, um, over the past year, what I've seen from the pandemic is other banks like coming out and talking about like their thoughts on working from home, like Goldman Sachs is a good example, saying like it's an abomination, never again. Um, like there's a whole other list of these kind of like reactions I'd seen in the media from other companies and how they they weren't supportive of it. So actually, for me, working in a company that kind of recognizes um, both the the importance on focusing on doing good work and executing, but also having a mindset. <clears throat> of supporting and caring about our colleagues as much as we do our customers and trying to make sure like whenever i look at is it called the queen's honors list where they, she gives out the obes 
I'm consistently impressed each year when I read through those how many Barclays members there are of like <clears throat> people who have done like good work in their community and um, people are having an impact on society. But I think that's just very much like emblematic of the culture we have around um, caring for ourselves and caring for our community. And you know, it's a big company, so I can't like blanketly say everyone's amazing because you know, there's going to be, of course, like in any company, but as a whole, the culture is amazing. And like, th there's so many people that make it a good place to work and like really try to support each other and support the community. And for me, it's made my job really fun, even if the actual work gets stressful or tough. That's so good to hear that because often culture kind of, uh... It becomes a slight deck when you pass like, you know, a thousand people. That's kind of becomes what the culture is about. Yeah. Well, actually, speaking of diversity, something that I think is such a cool story, but um, with Barclays when I joined, um, so they had reached out to me and I was loving things at Starling, as you can imagine, and really enjoying the team and the work and everything there. Um, but I knew that kind of given where I was in life, I wanted to have kids in the next few years. So even though I saw this opportunity with Barclays, and it kind of fit like career track and like impact and all that. I was like, oh, I'm gonna be such a disappointment if I join and have a kid in the next few years. And so I, I proactively told them really early on the interview process, I'm like, just so you know, I'm, this is like my kind of life plan. So just in case this is, a, you know, a problem from your perspective, I wouldn't want to move from somewhere like Starling that had a leader like Anne, who's very supportive, to somewhere who would, you know, maybe support it, but not be wildly excited about it. Support on paper. Yeah, and so I was like, you know, it's early enough in the interview process. They've got to be interviewing other people that they could just kind of be like, oh, this person's a better fit. And I wanted that because I wanted to say at Starling if they wouldn't like love the fact of me as a whole package, right? But they were over the top of like, no, that's amazing. Like we love, you know, people who want to, you know, live their lives fully and have families and do whatever they want to do. We'll support you in that and that's great. And then after um, uh, I got pregnant, I knew that they were about to promote me into my current role. And so I like very early on in the first trimester before telling family, I was like, well, I'm going to tell him because I don't want them to like put me into a new role and then be disappointed when I'm like, and I'm going to go on maternity leave. And they're like, that's amazing. That's so good. It'll be so great when you come back into this role. And I was like, oh, thank God. And so it's just been kind of like relief after relief of them being not just supportive, but like very genuinely um, kind of over the top, like helpful, supportive, like very much not seeing like family or anything that like that as a detriment to my career, which for me, seeing other female colleagues, you know, some, particularly in the U.S., you know, will have companies that are very kind of openly unsupportive. So it's not something I take for granted. I think that they've uh, really probably put a lot of effort into being uh, supportive for, for that end. Last, last thing I want to ask. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you know, you're Forbes 30 under 30. What, what, what's next on your, your tick off goals? You know, it's funny because that one was such a big bucket list item in terms of like career awards. But then after you get that, Genuinely, it's kind of like, well, I've kind of maxed out on the prizes I want. Yeah, I've like peaked in terms of awards. Like I have career goals and like in terms of like growth and seniority and leadership and all that, um, that I still have the, in terms of any type of external awards. I mean, unless I can get some sort of Nobel Peace Prize for my work in banking, I think. Like, I just can't even imagine anything. Like I love awards and I love being on lists. So like love continuing to like, you know, be recognized. But in terms of any external form of validation, I think the Forbes 30 Under 30 kind of did it in terms of like my, my bucket list for like awards. Um, I'm sure there's going to be something actually like most powerful, like Forbes Most Powerful Women. I think Fortune do something similar. It's probably some of those that'll come up that I'll find at some point. But um, but yeah, no, I think I'm I'm pretty happy with the set of awards to date. Well, congratulations. You've obviously finished all of these. You've managed to get all the way to the end. Oh my gosh, That's I'm good. really... Yeah, impressed that I did because honestly, those are really, really, really spicy. <laughs> so where can we find out? What's the best place to reach out to you? Yeah, um, probably on Twitter, still at Megan Kaywood. Um, it's probably the best place to find me. Not on TikTok? You know I am, but I don't really create videos yet. I'm more of just like the lurker who like goes through and endlessly like likes videos. So unfortunately, I'm not a big creator on there yet. But I am. I don't. I probably have some very obvious name of like at Megan Cooper or something. I don't know. There we go. Or, or, or yeah, Peloton. I'm at Megan Cooper on Peloton. So oh yeah, yeah. for the old uh, uh, the Nigel yeah. Walsh Fit Fam. Yeah. So for Fit Fam, you can find me there. <laughs> Brilliant. Excellent. Yeah. Thank thanks. Thank you. Well, thanks for the time. Of the time and thank yeah. you to uh, uh, FinTech South. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. For anyone who really likes spicy food, that, between that one and this one, I mean, if you just really want to torture yourself, like with going full tilt in a meal, that is it. Whew, my gosh.